welcome. My name is Christoph Mauch and I'm the director of the Rachel Carson Center and together with uh, Dr. Gesa Lüdecke, uh, we are moderating and convening the Tuesday discussions with environmental experts. We're alterating, so the next two sessions will be moderated by Gesa. Today I'm very happy to welcome Wolfgang Schulger, uh, Dr. Schulger, uh, or actually Professor Dr. Schulger. Uh, Dr. Schulger uh, comes from Franconia originally, uh, the north, somewhere in, up north there, and uh, that's where he grew up. Up north in Bavaria. Up north in Bavaria. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where he grew up and where he went to the university in Erlangen, which was famous, had a famous fac faculty at the time. Uh, but he went beyond, he went to Göttingen from there. Um, in Erlangen, I think it was, where, where he started a One World initiative. Um, it's not Lufthansa, One World. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> they have a freaking flyer program. It's a Eine Welt, so it's a, it's a One a World. Fair trade. Fair trade uh, shops. Shop, yeah. yeah. And he was actually the founder of the wholesale trade for Bavaria, for the Fair Trade, uh, for the Eine Welt Laden that exists. So. He was engaged very early in these environmental initiatives. And then, uh, well, he studied in the 1980s. He studied Protestant theology in the 1980s. And I, I can tell you from my own experience, because I studied Protestant theology in the 1980s as well, there were probably two groups of, uh, of, uh, of theology students. The one group would have been very politicized. They would have been uh, part of the peace movement, part of the environment movement protesting against cruise missiles, uh, buying, purchasing stuff only in the Weltladen, only Nicaragua coffee and carrying around bags, um, Stadt plastic bags, UT black bags only, and, uh, you immediately recognize them. Uh, and uh, they would have transformed, like in our seminary, we, uh, we started to eat 60% vegetarian. This was 1980s um, in the Stift in Tübingen. But, um, so uh, there was the other group that was very pietist, and uh, you can guess which group he belonged to. Of course, the pietist. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wolfgang Schulger was part of the politicized group. And one of the things that was also, I think, typical for the 1980s was that uh, there was very much of an interest in what was going on in the uh, so-called third world, but also in liberation theology, uh, indigenous movements, environmentalist movements, in Brazil, there were people like Chico Mendes, who was uh, protesting against the logging of the rainforest. And uh, so some of those who were really uh, activists went to places like Brazil. And Wolfgang Schulger was one of them. So he studied in Erlangen, Göttingen, and Brazil, and later on in Chicago, where he did his uh, first and second uh, doctorates. So uh, he studied theology, no surprise. <laughs> and uh, he is uh, an uh, adjunct professor of uh, systematic theology at the Augustana University in Neuendettelsau, which is a Catholic university. Also, no, Protestant. Pro of course, the Protestant. Uh, Augustana sounds so Catholic. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's a Protestant for a Protestant pastor. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's also uh, in Franconia, right? Yes, yeah, it is. I've never been there. It must be small. It is That's very small. Yeah. Very small. <laughs> Continue to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Later on. <laughs> okay. Tell us the joke later on. So, but I have to come to a, to an end. Uh, I should say that uh, while Wolfgang Schulte was a pastor, which is what you typically become after studying theology, he uh, in 2001, I think, moved to Munich from Franconia and has been here for the last 20 years. And first, uh, he was actually in charge of the welfare and social work division of the Protestant Church. And for the last 12 years, he's been in charge of the environmental affairs uh, part. Uh, there are many more things I could tell you. I could give you the titles of the books that he's written, but I would need to look it up. <laughs> and and I, I could tell you, and I will tell you that, that he was awarded the uh, Environmental Medal of the State of Bavaria for his environmental engagement in this state. So now we're really eager to hear from you, Wolfgang. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for this lovely introduction. And thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. And uh, I mean, Christoph already took part of my introduction. So uh, I think I could skip my presentation. Did we go into discussion? No, just joking. Uh, but in, in, in fact, I. The camera? Yeah. Yeah, could you But in fact, in, 
some way I will try to reconcile the both sides he mentioned before. So I will give you a short introduction in Church's engagement with the environment. Uh, I titled it Integrity of Creation. And that already shows that I will try to reconcile the pietist, the theological part, with uh, the engagement. So my first part is on theology, my second part is on engagement. And finally, I will uh, address two challenges for church people engaging with the environment. So this should be short in 10 minutes, I heard. And I heard also that nobody before me did it in 10 minutes. So I'm quite happy to try it. OK, uh, first part, um, theology. Um, why do we engage with environment as Christians, as Christian churches? Uh, I cite out of Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? How should we not engage with environment praising the creator as our God who created mankind and all creatures? Um, in fact, looking to the history, especially of the Protestant churches, not only the Lutheran church, but the Protestant churches in general, uh, we have forgot this part of our own roots for some decades, if not to say for some centuries. Um, and we engaged more with uh, piety, with uh, inner faith, with relation to Christ, and not that much with the environment and the world around us. But the biblical texts are quite clear that praising the creator means to be engaged with his creation. So um, engagement with the environment really started again again uh, in the 1980s. And so no wonder that I became part of this movement, uh, as you became in the peace movement, as you told me on the telephone, um, because uh, the World Council of Churches in 1983 started a so-called council program uh, justice, peace, and integrity of creation. A worldwide pilgrimage, so to say, uh, aiming to engage member churches in a conciliar process of mutual commitment, a covenant to justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. That should be, and that in fact was, for the next two decades, the focus of the World Council of Churches, the World Assembly of most of the traditional churches, uh, unless the Catholic Church, but even the Catholic Church is a visiting member of the World Council. So it's not a regular member, but a visiting member. Um, and in fact, that was a very strong uh, process. Uh, there was a big assembly. That was the beginning assembly in Vancouver, 83. There was a big assembly in Seoul, uh, South Korea in 1990. Really emphasizing Christians commitment with the environment as part of the lived faith of Christians. Uh, and already at that time, we in the northern world were seeing that uh, the environmental damages that we were causing uh, to our earth uh, were felt by our fellows, by our sisters and brothers in the south more deeply than we could imagine. Um, so this uh, impulse to build this covenant on justice, peace, and integrity of creation came by some way from the southern churches to the World Council. Because the northern churches at that time, 83, were more concerned with uh, atom missiles and uh, the, the um, Cold War between the East and the West. Uh, so peace and justice, yes, that were themes for the northern churches, but um, integrity of creation 
was the contribution set by the southern churches. Um, and so it was a very helpful and very lucky process for the rich northern churches to have this conciliar process, uh, justice, peace, and integrity of creation. Uh, and what I already mentioned, today um, our leading bishop here in Bavaria uh, and the chair of the Evangelical Church of Germany, um, the Covenant of Churches here in Germany, um, our bishop Heinrich Bedford Strom, um, he emphasizes that uh, I can't visit our partner church in Tanzania, addressing people as my brothers and sisters, and back to Germany, I forget that they are who are most suffering from climate change. And Tanzania's carbon footprint is far lower than Germany's. So engaging with the environment, engaging for a good future for every creature is part of global justice, is part of the lift love to the neighbor, as Jesus is calling us. Um, so this must be enough to show you that it's really part of faith engagement. It's not mere political, it's out of the faith. Uh, and so my second part, what are we doing uh, to be a climate aware church? Uh, I would say our best program here in Germany is uh, the so-called Green Rooster. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm not sure if this exists in English. Uh, in fact, there is uh, the Galo Verde in Brazil. Um, it's an eco-management program for local churches, um, oriented uh, by the European um, eco-management system, EMAS, um, but really adapted for local churches and for um, the reality that uh, we don't have a, a management team in the local church, in the parishes, but we have engaged people forming a team. So it's not a paid person or persons who will uh, move it forward, but uh, people out of the community. Um, it aims to really know the own energy uptake of the local church, the local community and uh, to know the ecological footprint. Uh, in local churches, you always have many engaged people with good ideas, but unfortunately, sometimes the good ideas are not the effective or, or the most effective. So a management system helps you to identify the most effective measures to improve your ecological footprint. And that is what the Green Rooster is doing. Uh, and it fosters participation and environmental awareness and spirituality within the whole congregation. So it's not just a management program, it's really a program to make people participate in the process of becoming a more uh, aware, a more ecological local community. Um, this is a quite strong program and uh, for the last 12 years uh, out of our 1,600 local churches here in Bavaria, more or less 200 joined the Green Rooster and are participating in this program. Um, every local church has to decide by the church council that they will participate, so it's a slow process, but it's a good number. Uh, probably one of the biggest numbers in the German churches. Um, and on the level of the Church of Bavaria, we set up a integral climate protection concept, Klimaschutz concept, yeah. Um, aiming climate neutrality not for a defined year, I have to confess, but somewhere in between 2040 and 2050. Um, addressing the challenges in an integral perspective, you see uh, in German here, because I just copied it out of uh, the Klimaschutz concept, um, in, in, in five uh, 
areas, buildings, mobility, um, acquisition. acquisition, thank you, uh, conscientization and organization. Um, church isn't producing anything. Uh, sure, we are producing faith, we are producing hope, hopefully, uh, and community and something more, um, but no, no hard goods. So our biggest impact on the environment comes from the buildings. And we have just about 6,000 buildings here in Bavaria. So you can imagine to improve these buildings is just a challenge. Uh, and we try to address this in the Klimaschutz concept by uh, 22 measures. I won't go through the measures right now. I just want to show you and uh, I think uh, they will get the presentation uh, online or anything. Okay, if you yeah. give it to us, would yeah. be great. Yeah, okay. So uh, it is linked to our homepage so you can uh, read it if you know German and if you want to look it up you can read it through. Um, so we have uh, the somewhat grassroots process of the green rooster from the local churches uh, and the conscientization that is linked with the green rooster and we have the top-down process of the climate protection concept uh, addressing the big goal for the whole Protestant Lutheran Church in Bavaria. Last part, what are the challenges? Obviously, as anywhere when you are talking about environment and climate protection, who will pay that or who will pay for that? Um, as the buildings are our biggest footprint, uh, they are our biggest challenge. And the cost of investment when you try to get a building to climate neutra neutrality are quite high. Um, at the moment we really don't know how to finance it. There are examples from other Protestant churches in Germany uh, who found a way to finance it, but we are still discussing. So uh, this uh, is a very open part. How will we finance these investments, which on the long run will repay because um, the costs for heating, for example, will lower down immensely. But in the beginning, there are the investments. Um, so maybe we should do it like the Protestant Church of Berlin Brandenburg, uh, who set up an own carbon emission tax. You know that there is in Germany there is a carbon emission tax since uh, two years ago, I think. Yeah, um, and it's still quite low. It's on, on 25 euro per uh, thousand kilogram uh, carbon uh, emission. And the uh, Berlin Brandenburg Church will start with uh, its carbon emission tax next year, pricing it by 130 euro. Only as church emission tax plus the governmental emission tax. Uh, so that was really a decision they made in the last year. Uh, and with these incomes, they will finance their investments on the buildings to get them climate neutral. Genius, but far away from our decision makers here in Bavaria. Um, or will generations to come pay for it? Uh, and will we lose the younger generation in our church because we are not addressing the needs and the desires of the younger generation? So um, I still hope that we will get to the second point, more or less, and uh, imitate the Berlin Brandenburg Church. But it's still a challenge. Uh, and the other challenge is how to foster awareness. Because, as Christoph mentioned in the beginning, there are very different kinds of spirituality in the German churches. And as we are Volkskirche, uh, it's not that you find your small, tiny church that is exactly your charismatic spirituality, your political spirituality, and so on. Uh, but there are big churches and there is the whole range of uh, spiritualities within the church. So uh, we have our engaged local churches, these 200 rooster churches. Um, but how to foster awareness within the 
remaining 1,400. Um, and of course, there are people even in our local churches saying, yeah, but uh, that's political action. Uh, church is about faith. And so, yes, again, it is all about faith because, as I told you in the beginning, God created mankind and all creatures and called us to stewardship for the weak and the voiceless. And the voiceless are the creatures in extinction and are the next generations who will suffer from a heated world. So the challenge today is loving our non-human neighbor. Not only loving our human neighbor, but loving our non-human neighbor. And within all the uncertainties that we are facing at the moment, maintain hope against hope. Many engaged people, when talking with me, are asking, can we still get to climate neutrality? Can we still get to the Paris uh, climate goal? We don't know it. But if we don't do anything, surely we won't get it. So let's do what we can. Thank you.